All right, so um, then we'll get into this violin playing thing. But I think we have to agree on a couple basic premises, and there's probably really these only these two things that all violinists will pretty much agree with. Otherwise, there's just debate, right? So uh, laws of violin playing. One that we can all pretty much agree on is that the bow should remain straight, or I mean perpendicular to the strings for the entire bow stroke, right? So in a, in a sense, when we're thinking about setup, we have to imagine that the violin and the bow are one unit. Because the violin, the angle of the strings to the body is what determines, well, the angle of the strings is what determines the angle of the bow. And so a lot of times we like to separate ourselves. And it's actually, it's completely understandable. When you're looking in the mirror and you're in the practice room, you look in the mirror, you see if your bow's straight. If it's not straight, your first inclination is probably to do something here and to forget that the violin is actually what's dictating that angle, right? Okay, so that's very important that, 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 that the violin and the bow are actually, in terms of setup, one unit. And then a lot of times it's also good to think of the bow as being twice as long as it actually is because we have to make sure that all of what's happening in this arm is good during the entire stroke, not just in one part of the bow. Okay, so that the second one would just be that most people agree that the violin should be fairly parallel to the floor within a range, right? There's sort of an acceptable range. All right, so with that said, the, my teacher likes analogies, or I don't know what you'd call these, but um, I'm not, this is not because I think you're children or anything, but she used to talk about four guys in violin playing. And so we're going to start with the first guy is the shoulder. Now the shoulder is a ball and socket joint, and it's actually a very shallow socket. So a lot of times there's an analogy made between a, a golf ball and a tee, where the golf ball is, is the top of the humerus here, and then the socket is very, very shallow. So actually what you find is that there are like three major muscle groups, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a doctor, that actually their main function is to pull that ball into the shoulder joint. Because if they didn't, then any sort of like heavy moving would probably dislocate the shoulder. Okay, so there's those muscles alone, and then there's these muscles that move this way, here and here, and up and down, and the shoulder can, is the most mobile joint in the body. Okay, so it's also one of the more complex though, because it can move in so many different ways. Um, so this guy, the shoulder guy, is the elevator guy. And in violin playing, she used to say, the elevator guy, his main responsibility is to change the level of the strings. Okay, now we're gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but this motion originating from up here, um, not so good in my opinion, and in hers. And she used to demonstrate, and I'll demonstrate a little bit too. So he's the elevator guy, and that's really his primary motion. Now that's his active motion. Every joint in the body also has some sort of passive motions. So the passive motion, you'll get, you're going to see people's upper arm move back and forth. But in, I think in, you know, if you look at Oistrakh, his bow arm, yeah, the upper arm moves. But the, the, the point of orig, origination of the, of the basic day-to-shea day stroke is really up here because that would activate this, all right? So there's the elevator guy. Now, below that is the elbow. And the elbow, um, she called, well, I'll get to that in a second. It's a hinge joint, and it can literally only move in two directions, flexion and extension, right? Flexion, extension. Now this rotation happens below the elbow, so the elbow itself can only move in two. So compared to the shoulder, which can move in the most ways possible, the elbow can only move in two, which is the, I mean, I, I would think that would be the least ways, right? Um, so it's actually relatively complex, or simple. The elbow is quite simple. Um, so this is good. Now the, the elbow is called, she called the measuring stick guy, and that's because the measuring stick guy has an acute awareness of distance traveled in the joint. Now, distance traveled in violin playing is essentially rhythm. Rhythm is kind of distance over time in the bow. Okay, so if we aren't accessing this, and he's the, he's the, he's the primary point of origination of the day-to-shea day, day stroke, of the basic violin stroke, and a lot of things are, are based on the day-to-shea. Okay, so this is the guy who, who does this. 
And he does that well because he can feel the distance travel. She used to call it the inner gogics of the bow. This has a, a musical um, component to it as well because rhythm is a part of, is one of the sort of areas of musical expression, right? But in order to be really effective in terms of our timing um, and that sort of thing, we have to be able to feel in a physical sense um, the rhythm passing in the arm. And people can hear it too. We have to sort of lead the listener and then we give them these, these flags along the way and then we push and pull against those. And that's like rubato, I think a lot of times is what people would say, right? So if we can't set up that rhythm, Mm, then we might not be able to really pull people through the piece effectively, as effectively as possible. All right, so um, there's that. And then he's, there's a lot of technical things too, because really violin playing or viola playing is, is coordination of the right and left hands. And the body likes to mirror. So if you look at the basic shifting motion, basic shifting motion happens here. If the basic bowing motion happens here, then you're in balance. Then you're moving, moving in mirror. And the body likes that. That's why a lot of times when we have a really long upward shift, we want to put that on an up bow because it's the same motion. Same with down bow. This is a little bit more challenging. And then this is not, there's no more mirror because we're moving here and not here. Okay. So um, very important. This is, this was the main thing that she used to No, no, that's not right. So um, we'll look a little bit more at that later as well. So now the, the, the next guy is the wrist. The wrist is a slightly more complex um, joint than the elbow because he can move in this way, not just this way, but this way. Now, interestingly, there's been a, there was an article done by some researchers that was published in the Medical Problems of Performing Artists Journal, which is sort of like the, one of the major journals, medical journals for all sorts of artist problems like ballet dancers and clarinetists and string players account for a large portion of it. Um, they studied and, and they, they found that if you gradually increase the curve of the wrist, you'll lose a lot of gripping strength in the in hand. In fact, I, th I don't remember the exact figures, but it was, I think, up to, like, up to or beyond 50 to 80% of strength. And you can feel that. It's not hard to feel. So when we see this sort of position as a basic position, as like the home base position, I think that's kind of problematic. And they speculated, as doctors do, that, um, that it could be a, a, a pretty big con potential cause of tenoditis and all sorts of injuries, in especially the right arm, right? Okay, so because we, we're, we're, we're in the business of, we're athletes, and we're doing repetitive motions for hours on end. And if you do, that's, that's hard enough on the muscles. And then if you throw in this, this added stress on it by weakening it, it's not hard to see why that might you know, not be so good for us. So now the wrist, she called the drunk guy. And the drunk guy is, is in, in, I think, prob in, in most of our playing and most of the time we're playing, he's sort of in a passive role, which is like a connector. So he, he, helps, he helps smooth bow changes. Um, this guy is kind of rigid. He can't move like that, right? So we need some help from the wrist. In an active state, he maybe helps with string crossings, that kind of thing. But I would say that she called it the drunk guy because that's kind of his basic role. And if you, I like to think of it as like, um, um, like three guys in a line and they're walking really fast. And on one side, you've got the measuring stick guy, you know, walking like that. And then you've got the fingers, which we'll get to in a second, but, you know, really short little motions. And then you've got this guy in between, you know, who keeps them all together. That's, that's, that's the way I imagine the drunk guy. All right. So... Um, it's, it's, it's important, like I said, to kind of keep that, the wrist likes to be in the neutral position. And from there you can do more, but I think that would, that's a good place to have as, as his home base. Now the fingers have a range, many different sorts of joints, some joints different than the, these guys, so I won't say what kind of joints, I'm not going to name them, but she called them the tick-tock guys. And the tick-tock guys, because compared to the length of the bow, they travel very short distance and their active motion is quite small and sharp. So their active role in violin playing, she used to say was sort of articulation and they kind of get the, the pop at the beginning of the notes, right? But a lot of times, I think probably most of the time they're in a little bit more of a passive role and working in conjunction with the wrist to kind of smooth the bow changes.